Without further ado, I would like to welcome Jed Carney and Andrew Lee to the conversation. Um, we're going to talk about what we mean by full employment. Are you both there and can you unmute yourselves if you are, please? Absolutely. G'day, Emma. G'day, Jed. Hello. Hi, Emma. Hi, Andrew. Hello, both of you. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Um, We've already had a little bit of a conversation uh, about uh, what we mean by full employment with Wayne, um, and there are certainly some strong views from the participants here today on what full employment looks like. Wayne said he believes that the, um, the correct rate of, of uh, unemployment really in Australia to start the economy growing and wage growth growing is around about 3%. What I wanted to do today was get both of your views about what we mean when we say full employment, uh, because of course uh, we have, as has been raised already today, a thing called the NIRU, the non-accelerating rate of uh, inflationary rate of unemployment, um, which has been described by Lachlan McCall earlier today as um, morally indefensible. Um, and then we have the view that we should, should have a much more active monetary and fiscal policy role to target an unemployment rate closer to 2 or 3%, which was what was achieved, of course, uh, in the post-war years. Um, Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Uh, obviously, uh, with vast experience in this field, youngest ever professor of economics at the Australian National University, um, and one of our leading thinkers and economists. Um, would you like to kick this off? G'day, Emma, and uh, thanks to, uh, to all of you for joining the conversation. It's uh, great to be here at uh, Old Parliament House, welcoming you all to Canberra. <laughs> oh, wait, we didn't get to do that bit. But <laughs> anyway, uh, I'm, I'm here on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, so let me acknowledge uh, them uh, at, uh, at the opening of the remarks. Uh, I certainly wouldn't quibble with uh, Wayne's ambition there, Emma. I think uh, aiming to get unemployment as low as possible uh, ought to be a driving part of Labor's mission. And part of this is because we recognise that jobs aren't just a source of income, they're also a source of dignity. Uh, there's a terrific study that was done by Nick Carroll some years back, which looked at the happiness of people who, when they lost their jobs and found that the hit to happiness was $60,000 even putting aside the income loss. So in order to make a jobless person just as happy as somebody with a job, then you have to compensate them by paying them $60,000 more than the person in employment. And I, that to me really drives a stake through the heart of this view that somehow we can just give up on the world of work, roll out universal basic incomes and everybody will be happy playing video games in their parents' basements. It's just not, not the way the world works. So I think this is a terrific event, not only to remind us the ambition of the post-war period, that white paper on full employment, that notion to not just go back to 1939, but to build the place better, uh, but also the fundamental role that work plays. Uh, and that while we look through these debates and automation, we should never give up on the importance of work as, as progressives. The uh, Reserve Bank estimates that full employment somewhere in the order of uh, low 4%. Uh, that certainly seems like the, uh, the, the best estimate from the state, of, the state of the art there. But if we can get it lower, that's fantastic. Problem is, we've sat around 5% uh, for years now. Uh, while uh, we, we outperformed the rest of the world in the global <laughs> financial crisis, we underperformed the rest of the world uh, in the post-GFC years. Uh, and for a while, they had an unemployment rate higher than the OECD average, uh, which Australia shouldn't have. Uh, so getting unemployment lower uh, has got to be a, a core, a core priority. Uh, right now, all of us would be pretty happy if we could just get it back to the 5% we had at the start of the year. But long term, we should be looking to get it well below that. Uh, and I'm happy to go into to some of the benefits that that would bring if we've got time, Emma. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'd also like to, to flag that um, we've, we've heard from Stephen Kennedy, the head of Treasury, of course, say that he thinks the real unemployment rate, if you take off some of the masking um, that's provided by JobKeeper, is probably already closer to 10%. Um, and that our underutilisation rate now, if you add in underemployment, which is leaped to 13.7% or something, um, is close to one in five people that are looking for more work already. And on the other side of this crisis, um, when the economy reopens, I think on current policy settings, which seems to be to remove JobKeeper, return JobSeeker to its previous poverty rates, um, and all of those um, holds on, on business loan repayments will all come out at the same time, we could see a significant crash at that point if the government doesn't do something different. Mm. 
Um, that's just my little public service announcement in the middle here. Um, but I'm going to throw to Jed now because Jed, of course, um, as a former president of the Australian Council of Trades Union, uh, long time uh, representative of, pe of working people in Australia, I know you've also got really strong views about full employment and how we should get there. I do, and I've got to say, Emma, that I'm a little bit daunted being here with Wayne Swan and Andrew Lee. I'm talking about <laughs> concept because I am not an economist, but the way I view um, full employment, and I've, I've got to say, ever since I started to talk about full employment, you and Per Capita have been fantastic support and have really helped me understand the concept and, and develop it a lot more. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank you so much you. for um, the work that you're doing on this and and, and your help and, and promoting it as a concept, an economic concept, which as we know, isn't new, uh, been around a long time. Uh, I guess um, I, I welcome Andrew's comments and uh, he and I maybe differ a little bit on, on the need for an IRU or a concept of an IRU. Um, I'm a little bit in the park that, well, no, I don't think we really need one. Um, and, and more that we should aim to have work for everybody who needs it. And, I think there were lots of comments. I was watching some of the chat and a lot of people pointed out that during the, the years of the white paper policy and the full employment policy, unemployment sat around 2.5, 2.7%. And uh, I was watching someone said, oh yes, but workforce participation wasn't as great. Well, I'd like to remind everybody that we actually absorbed around 2 million migrants during that time. And um, so when, yes, it's true, women weren't so much, I guess, involved in the workforce and participation wasn't as great today. We, we did manage to absorb a large proportion of the population under that policy. For me, the concept of full employment is really a frame of mind um, that sort of does away with that concept that we need a certain amount of people always to be unemployed, um, that we should drive for full employment. I agree wholeheartedly with Andrew that a decent job is, gives, it is about dignity and it has to be a decent job and it has to be one that gives you a living that doesn't mean you are underemployed. If it doesn't give you a decent living and it's not something that keeps a roof over your head and food on the table and some extra, much like the lovely old Australian concept of the basic wage, which of course we can say is Australian as well, um, then it's exploitation in my view. So I just want to put a caveat on that. And that if, um, you know, I, I Christian Porter on the radio the other day talking about this new accord business. Oh, yes, we're going to be working with um, the union movement. And then when he was pressured on the point of decent work, he could say, oh, oh no, well, it's really just about getting a job at all costs, basically. Well, a job, in my view, is not just a job, as I said before. But um, I don't disagree with Wayne. Wayne said, um, explained what he thought were the, the main elements of full employment. For me, that I would add um, two other things to that. I think, yes, um, government expenditure and income is an important part, progressive tax, um, expenditure adjustment that governments, implies that governments can pull levers that create jobs. We've talked a lot about that, construction, um, co-investment in manufacturing, making sure that it's, uh, that, sure, there is some government direct employment. It doesn't matter, you know, you look here in Victoria where Dan Andrews has employed 1,100 more nurses. He built up the ambulance service, made sure that casual public sector uh, workers were made permanent. Um, there is a role for full employment and, and I'm sure we're gonna to get to a jobs guarantee a bit later. So I'll, we'll come to that a bit later. But I would add to that, that we need to make sure that people are educated and have the skills. And we need an education system that is accessible and available to everybody and provides the skills that we need uh, for both the future uh, jobs and the jobs we have now. And of course, underpinning that with the decent social security system. I absolutely agree with Wayne that any full employment policy has to be multicolored. <laughs> sure, um, I, I love that term and I'm gonna steal it. Thanks Wayne. Um, and that it's not just about uh, the green economy, which of course is vitally important and there's a whole lot we can do and we could start with upgrading our grid. Um, which would be a fantastic infrastructure project, I think. Uh, but uh, that, that is really important. We have a huge services sector and a massive care economy that we really need to invest in and boost and professionalise and stabilise and recognise. And I think that's a big conversation that we could have around the care economy. 
The regions, of course, are very important. There's a lot we could do with regions in our agricultural sector as well. Happy to expand on any of these things. You can see I've thought about this a fair bit. <laughs> One last thing I want to say, though, is it's not just a federal government policy. It is an overarching federal government um, lever that needs to be pulled towards everybody having a job, but it is something that can be delivered very much at a state level and I am really passionate about this at a local government level as well and happy to expand on any of those things a bit later. Thank you so much, Jed. Um, I love the, the fact that, that it's emerging not just in what you've just said but also in the chat as well that we talk about the care economy and we talk about women's work and how much it's undervalued in our society. Um, and of course, you're, you're right, at the time of the post-war reconstruction, there weren't a lot of women in the paid labour force, but that didn't mean they, they weren't working. <laughs> Um, and so I'd like to get Andrew's views on this because this is something I'm, we're doing quite a bit of work on at Per Capita. It's a, a personal um, passion project of mine is, is the care economy or the foundational economy and how we strengthen that. Um, these are undervalued jobs, aren't they? And they are low paid jobs, a lot of the, the jobs in those services and care work. Um, and they've often been described as unskilled jobs, which really gets my goat because they're not unskilled. There's nothing unskilled about being a disability care worker. What, what could we try, Andrew, that would um, increase the wages and conditions of those jobs and make them more attractive to men? I think this is, uh, Emma, about uh, expanding our conception as to what is valued work and what is work that uh, is, uh, is perhaps less important to the economy. And one of the things that COVID has taught us is that uh, many of those so-called essential jobs in sectors like finance and marketing uh, actually uh, could uh, have the pause button pressed on them for a couple of months without the rest of the economy really noticing. And the same just could not be said for the people stacking the supermarket shelves, the people who were looking after uh, those with dis disabilities. Uh, we worked out very quickly over the last couple of months what were the really essential jobs in Australia. Uh, and it turned out that they were, in many cases, not the best paid jobs in Australia. And so that uh, I hope that will feed into the conversation around wage inequality. Uh, the fact that we have seen since 1975 wages growing three times as fast for those in the top tenth as for those in the bottom tenth. So surgeons and financial dealers have seen wages growing three times as fast as cleaners and checkout workers, uh, meaning those bottom paid occupations are $16,000 a year worse off than they would be if their wages had kept pace with those at the top. Uh, we need too, to, uh, to recognise that full employment uh, brings with it a greater sense of egalitarianism in the labour market. Uh, so one of the things that happens when the unemployment rate goes up is it becomes easier for employers to be choosy uh, and easier for them to discriminate and let their prejudices uh, go, run, run rampant. Uh, so we, uh, we have uh, only, uh, as, as we get the unemployment down to, uh, to full employment, uh, do we start to put pressure on employers uh, to do less discrimination towards people with disabilities, towards older Australians, towards Indigenous Australians. Uh, I do these regular Inequality Bites videos, and we put up uh, number 11 this week, uh, which was uh, looking at the unemployment rate uh, and looking at the unemployment rate for various subgroups. So we pointed out that uh, even at the end of 2019, with the headline unemployment rate at 5%, uh, unemployment was 13% for people with less education or people with a disability and unemployment was 21% for Indigenous Australians, uh, meaning that even before COVID hit, unemployment uh, Indigenous Australians faced the same unemployment rate as the broader labour market faced in 1932, in the teeth of the Great Depression. Uh, so we only managed to extend work to some of the most disadvantaged groups in Australia when we get that unemployment rate down. And I think that's a, a critical reason why we need to be passionate as progressives uh, about full employment. Uh, if we think it's all right to put up the double digit unemployment, uh, then it will become almost impossible for some Australians uh, not to get work. Totally agree with Jed on the need for uh, skills. Uh, and I think when we're looking at job creation, uh, we want to uh, have in mind uh, the, how we can make the dollars go as far as possible. If you want to, create jobs, if you want the government to pay the full wage, 
uh, then you need to think about the level of, of taxation that would support that. Uh, so if you want to create one job in 100, uh, then if everything's raised by personal income taxes, just to keep it simple, you need a 1% tax on all workers just in order to pay for that program. Uh, so you won't, you won't be able to uh, extend full employment that far uh, through paying the entire wage bill. But if you pay part of the wage bill, if you use a wage subsidy program like Sweden or France or Britain or the United States have, uh, and uh, we're the kind that Labor took to the last election with our new jobs tax credit, uh, then the, uh, the government can just push an employer over the line into adding another job. Uh, and that I think is, is probably a more promising way of, uh, of boosting full employment. Uh, I also think, uh, and I'll make this my final comment before throwing back, we need to look at new business formation. Uh, if you want new jobs, you need new businesses. And we've stagnated in that way. Uh, the economy was creating more new businesses uh, as, a, as a share of the economy back at the start of the 20, 21st century than we are today. Uh, stagnant new business formation is a, a competition problem, uh, but it flows directly through to workers uh, who don't have as many opportunities if there aren't the new firms starting up. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm just going to throw this in again before we keep talking, which is please, if you haven't already done so, rename yourself with the number of the room that you want to join in 15 minutes or so when we go to the breakout sessions. Um, I want to bring in specifically now talk about the impact of this uh, economic crisis caused by the pandemic on young people in Australia. Um, because emerging uh, into the labour market at the beginning of your career um, in, an, in a market where there's one in five uh, level of, under, of underutilisation and a persistently high unemployment, uh, as we know, can really scar what we call economic scarring. It can scar young workers for life. Jed, you and I have talked at length about this with um, my colleague as well, Shirley Jackson, who's going to be um, publishing something very shortly on youth unemployment for us, um, and what we can do about that. Because one of the problems we have, of course, is that a lot of the entry level jobs that young people used to take um, are, are, are being removed from our economy. Um, and we have a, a big mismatch at times between skills training and the demands of the labour market. Um, and Jed, I'd just like you to, to sort of reflect on this and the, the discussions that we've had about creating some kind of youth guarantee, uh, looking at, at different models around the world that ensure that young people are either offered a training place or, um, or, a, or a pay position uh, at the beginning of their career that can ensure that they can build a good career. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah, look, even before the COVID crisis, as you said, we were seeing youth unemployment at incredibly high levels, particularly in regional areas in double digits, as you would know. Um, and uh, the reasons for that, I think, are really varied. I mean, some of the, the greatest employers that are young people in apprenticeships and traineeships, of course, were the public service were publicly owned facilities and utilities. And, uh, you know, we've seen apprenticeships fall by in their hundreds of thousands over recent times because of lack of investment in our young people. We've seen the migration program used to in, um, import migrant workers where they are, you know, um, we bring them over under, under a, a skilled um, visa, I'm not aware, but people do unscrupulous employers, unfortunately. And then they are, uh, are not employed in that skilled area at all. They're basically given labour entry jobs, market entry jobs, um, and are often exploited. And uh, I have so many examples of where that has um, locked young people out of the, the labour market. I couldn't begin to tell you. Uh, there's, you know, I think if, if, if we got onto uh, government expenditure and I think ways that you could um, ensure that, young people do get the chance to get a job and do get that experience and do get into the labour market. Uh, we are going to, I think, an area of full employment policy. That could be a, certainly a very important part of it, uh, where, for example, government procurement could insist that um, anyone who gets a government contract must employ a certain amount of apprentices or young people or trainees uh, on construction sites, in manufacturing, Etc. I think that is a very practical thing that Labor governments have done in the past and have always been quite prepared to do. Uh, there's lots of other areas, particularly in the regional areas, but you and I have talked about a jobs guarantee, uh, a youth guarantee for young workers that I think could equally apply to older workers who have been locked out of the market as well. But um, uh, 
these aren't heard of, these aren't new either. These are, have been used before in many, many instances. And it's basically a situation where a young worker would be guaranteed a job. Um, direct employment, I think, by the government. It's being done in Australia. There's an example in Queensland, Emma, that I know I've spoken to you about, um, where uh, third parties like an NGO or in this instance, say, a rec link or, or an organisation like Catholic Social Services or um, any sort of NGO is asked to employ young people um, and find a partner to make sure that there is meaningful work for them. The example that I have from Queensland is where RecLink are given money to employ young people. They go to a local government organisation, the council, and ask the council for it, if they have any projects. The council comes up with projects, for example, a, a vacant block of land being turned into a playground and a park. Um, the young people are hit, hooked into TAFE. They're given um, training in, how, in horticulture, in, in construction, various types of degrees. They are helped with their, their health issues. If they have any social issues, they're made sure that those wraparound services are there. And in the Queensland example, they're employed for only six months, but they have an 80% success rate where young people coming out of that program go into full-time work. Uh, it could be that we guarantee that they get access to to education. I know that Shirley's really, really keen on this format of a jobs guarantee where um, we utilise our public educators, the TAFE system, and I'm a huge fan of our public provider in the vocational education and training sector is that we, we resource TAFE up um, and actually fund young people to go and uh, get qualifications and make sure that they can get the practical experience that goes along with that. I think this is um, an area where we could trial a jobs guarantee and see with a smaller proportion of the population, even locally, even limit it to regional areas, if you like, uh, where we could actually see how it could work. Um, and I I'm really looking forward to Shirley's paper and uh, that coming out soon. Thanks, Jed. Um, that enough explanation? Um, no, that was, that was terrific. And um, we, don't, we don't want to gazump Shirley's, uh, Shirley's publication either, do we? <laughs> But we do have a related question on this from Nina Roxburg. Um, Nina, can you unmute yourself and ask your terrific question, please? Yes, okay, hi, sorry. Thank you so much for this interesting discussion. Um, I'm just curious that it's really great to see this idea of the youth guarantee coming through in many places in many conversations lately, but I wonder how we can guarantee young people work that they actually want, um, something that's meaningful and that contributes to their happiness and well-being, rather than, for example, in Victoria, we've got a lot of people that are walking around cleaning and sanitising handrails, and I don't know if that's what they desire to do with their life, but, yeah, so it's that's my question. Thanks. Andrew, do you want to take that one? Yeah, thanks, Emma. I, I, mean, I, I love the ambition of, uh, of uh, ensuring that people don't face that early period of joblessness. Uh, I left high school in 1990, uh, and that was in the teeth of our last uh, awful recession. And I just remember seeing mates attempting to find jobs and, and just the, the soul-crushing sense that it was essentially impossible for a young person in that environment to find work. Uh, you've talked about the scarring effect. I mean, some of these studies find significant scars on the CVs of people who faced uh, high unemployment even a decade after the recession has passed. Uh, there's the effect on self-esteem, but also the effect on skills. Uh, so I think we need to, to be extraordinarily focused on ensuring that people don't face those periods of joblessness. Uh, and we've known even in recent years that the share of people leaving university going into part-time rather than full-time work was going up uh, remarkably. Uh, so, so that's partly about skills matches and partly about the, uh, the amount of demand. Uh, just one thing in terms of how we measure this, I'm less convinced now that the, uh, the metric of youth unemployment uh, tells us everything we need to know. Uh, this is, after all, the share of job seekers who have a job. Uh, I'm not sure what people think the optimal uh, youth unemployment rate for 15-year-olds should be, but given that in pretty much every state and territory in Australia, a 15-year-old is required to be in school, I'm not sure we'd actually want a policy in which there are plenty of jobs available for 15-year-olds, tempting them to leave, leave school when they're, uh, they, they shouldn't be. Uh, so we want to think more broadly about youth participation in either 
burning or learning uh, and about the seamlessness of, uh, of moving between those two. Uh, we know from other countries that uh, there's a trade-off between specificity and generality. Uh, systems like the German apprenticeship system do very well in specifically training, uh, with training workers to undertake a specific task. Uh, they have low youth unemployment rates uh, and very high wages uh, for apprentices in their 20s. But then when they're in their 50s, people in the German, German system uh, often discover that the labour market has changed, technology has come along and their skills aren't wanted any longer. I prefer a, a Swiss system or the Austrian system uh, in which uh, people get a broader range of skills and are better able to retrain. Perhaps their wages are a little lower in their 20s, but over the lifetime that uh, those general skills pay off. Uh, we can't forecast where the, uh, the labour market is going to go. Uh, so general skills are, uh, are definitely the way to go. And ultimately, it's not going to be possible for the government to uh, employ uh, a majority of young, young Australians off the government payroll. Not even Scandinavia does this. So as Jed says, it's got to be about skills at its heart and improving the, uh, the quality and quantity of the skills system why you would cap domestic undergraduate places at Australian universities next year is beyond me. This is the time we should be opening up the universities to any young person with the uh, talents to under undertake a degree. Uh, why would we be paying unemployment benefits to somebody uh, who, uh, who wants, wants to study? Uh, let's, uh, let's open up those opportunities. Thanks, Andrew. Um, I'm going to ask Maria Matthews. Uh, you've, you've made an excellent point and a, a question that I'd really like uh, to explore, perhaps with Jed on this one, um, about the way that the Commonwealth Employment Service in the post-war period worked with the union movement. Are you there, Maria? Can you yes, unmute you. yourself? Yeah, I just unmuted myself. Right. Can you ask your question? <laughs> uh, there we go. Do, do, do. <laughs> so I read that... Um, while working on a uni assignment, this was um, addressing how to scrap work for the doll, that the Commonwealth Employment Service in its early years was linked to trade unions in a program to help unemployed workers in transition to employment with their knowledge of who were the good employers and their support in coaching workers of their rights. Could we see a return of such a program in a full employment scheme? I would love to see that. How are you? Anyway, I'm nice great. to see you. Good, <laughs> love to see you. Um, yeah, look, there were lots in that post-war period. There were um, so many different schemes available to people. There was the um, Commonwealth Rehabilitation Training Scheme, which was mostly aimed at soldiers returning um, from war who needed to retrain and reskill, and then they were linked into meaningful work straight afterwards or during their training. Most of it was. Um, very much trades-based uh, sort of training, but nevertheless, it was incredibly successful and set people up for the rest of their lives. Um, the idea that we could actually um, uh, partner with the trade union movement to make sure that those jobs were decent jobs, that they were meaningful, that they weren't being put into an exploitative arrangement, I think, is really a wonderful idea. You, you know, we've uh, we have many schemes like that around the world. Um, in Australia, the one that comes to mind is the textile, clothing and um, footwear unions, um, fair trade um, uh, program where they identify uh, uh, textile uh, manufacturers in Australia who actually do employ people under decent conditions. As you know, it's an incredibly exploitative industry where people do piecework. Um, from home, um, uh, largely migrant women work in that area and they did a fantastic job, the TCFUA, of making sure that they can advertise employers who do the right thing. And then on top of that, they encourage consumers to buy the products from those um, companies that do the right thing. So that's the Fair Wear. Um, I think it's called Fair Wear, the Fair Wear uh, program. So... There are a number of these around. Uh, they're fairly small scale, but yeah, it's something that I think we could definitely scale up and um, you know do, do a lot more with. When I was at the ACTU, uh, we tried to start, uh, well, and also um, the hospitality union, of course, has the Fair Plate uh, program, where you know if you go to a restaurant and you eat there, that they're actually paying award wages and uh, that they are looking after their staff. So that's another example of where that's working. So, yeah, I think it's a great idea and I think that we probably could do a lot more of that. 
Well, that might be something that we can um, explore further through our work on employment services reform. Um, and there is a breakout session on that coming up. So uh, jump into that one if you want to talk about that some more, Maria. Um, I'm going to take one last question um, from Rod Pickett, who had a question about financialisation in the economy. And I think this might be one for Andrew. It's not one for me or Jed, probably. <laughs> Rod, are you there? It yeah. Is Thanks, Emma. Look, um, yeah, I mean, just, uh, I mean, um, uh, this is not my, my idea necessarily, but, you know, of course, we've always been concerned about the lack of the, the where investment is going into the economy or not going into the economy. And so the question of uh, rent seeking, I think, as I've heard uh, talked about, uh, and the concept of definancializing the economy. Um, and there's a lot of things that could be done in the Australian economy to, to uh, move away from that rent-seeking behaviour. And it just seems to me that if we could, uh, you know, keep that in back of our minds as one of our policy goals uh, around the way that we can help uh, direct investment into those sectors of the economy that produces value and therefore creates the conditions for, uh, for, for better more employment and better quality employment through productivity and a whole range of other things that come out of productive investment. So my question is, you know, is that a, is that a worthwhile objective, I guess, and how might we, what are some of the levers that we can use to get there? Thanks, Rod. Rod I think that's a, a fabulous question. Thanks for, uh, thanks for raising it. Uh, we know that uh, finance performs an important role in the economy. Uh, Paul Keating talked about one of the things that fired him up in politics was uh, the inability of regular middle class families to get a loan to start a business in the 1950s and 1960s. Uh, at its simplest, finance allocates people who want to lend money out uh, to people who want to borrow it for productive investments. And well, that, when that system works well, it's enormously beneficial to the economy. But it's not that, that complicated a role. And I think increasingly, we've made it way more complicated than it needs to be. Uh, finance as a share of the economy has grown massively over recent decades. Uh, partly in Australia, you see it even more so in the United States, where it's one of the factors turbocharging inequality. Uh, and finance has become more complicated than it needs to be, uh, such as the securitisation of home loans, which uh, helped uh, bring down the world economy uh, in 2008, 2009. Uh, we want to keep and make it much simpler and simpler than it is at the moment. Uh, if you're investing money, we know that the typical managed, uh, managed investor uh, underperforms the stock market uh, and that putting money into vanilla index funds uh, is actually a, a much better investment and reduces the overheads. Uh, so getting down some of those excess costs in our superannuation system uh, is important for people in boosting their retirement, retirement savings uh, and would allow the economy to, uh, to divert, to spend more resources on really productive activities. Uh, people shouldn't be paying uh, one, two, three percent to those who are managing their money. Uh, it should be uh, a fraction of one percent is go going on the overheads. And Rod, you didn't mention it, but I think this also comes up in the housing market. One of the things we've done in Australia, unlike many European countries, is we've turned housing from a consumption good into an investment good. Uh, if you go to Germany, there's just a norm that house prices don't rise very much. People can afford to, afford to buy a house uh, and many people are, are owners uh, and, uh, and are not, put, not using housing as an investment. In Australia, we've, we've made changes to the tax system that have encouraged people to speculate on property, uh, an enormously inefficient way of, uh, of diverting a huge amount of human and uh, physical resources, uh, which doesn't help the economy grow faster. Uh, so, uh, so getting away from that notion of housing as, a, as a, uh, the pl an investment, uh, getting away from spending too much in the finance sector, uh, and getting a more dynamic real economy uh, would be a really exciting goal for me. We rank very low on economic complexity in Australia, the diversity of what we do, the strength of our advanced manufacturing sector. Uh, and when we, get, when we boost that side, uh, we'll not only create more businesses, but we'll also create more jobs uh, and help achieve that goal of full employment, which, by the way, will help wages grow again. Uh, you want wage, wage growth, you've got to get un unemployment down. 
uh, and have that competition for workers, which is ultimately the, the, uh, uh, the competitive dynamic uh, that'll help us get wages growing again. Um, thanks, Emma. Thanks all the participants. Great conversation. Thanks, Jed. Hope to see you uh, in person next week. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thank you both. Um, and I would, I would uh, say we hope to see you both um, when we hold the summit that was planned for today at Old Parliament House. We are still going to go ahead with that in, uh, hopefully in late September. Um, so we hope you can come along to that and all of you as well um, to continue this conversation. Um, but between now and then, we'll be publishing a range of policy papers on some issues that have been discussed today. And, and particularly at the end there, as Andrew talked about um, the, you know, the commodification of housing and how we, we've uh, skewed that in Australia. We've been doing some work on, on housing um, and homelessness and uh, social housing here at Per Capita. And we're also doing uh, quite a bit of work on that lack of complexity in our economy and the um, diversifying our industrial base as well. We recognise that tackling um, full employment and creating full employment, particularly in a way that can help us to tackle climate change, um, is going to require a multifaceted approach that pulls on all of these levers. So um, we will be doing a great deal of different pieces of work um, to, to further that conversation and try to get up, get some policies together that might help. And to that end, we are now going to break out into four rooms uh, where you will meet my very talented team of researchers here at Per Capita. I am, uh, I often say to people, my only real skill is recruitment. I'm, uh, I'm, ex I'm very, very lucky and very good at finding great people um, and I've got a great team. So uh, if you want to talk about how we tackle underemployment and insecure work, please go to room, you'll be going to room one where you will uh, meet Matthew Lloyd Cape and Warwick Smith. If you want to talk about how we can reform employment services, you'll be going to room two with Simone Casey. If you are going to talk about rebuilding our manufacturing capacity, that will be in room three with Shirley Jackson. And if you are going to uh, join the conversation about investing in social housing, public and community housing, then you'll be going to room four with Miff and Jordan and Abigail Lewis. Um, and I will be shutting up for a while and letting my very um, talented researchers lead those conversations um, but I'll be lurking in the background and I'll, I'll see you all back here just before one o'clock to hear from Michelle O'Neill and John Falzon. So uh, please enjoy those conversations and you'll be put into those rooms automatically now. If you haven't renamed yourself, you won't be relocated. So please try to do that uh, if you want to join those conversations. Thank you.